Hello, welcome back to Open Relationships, Transform Me Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by my co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and producer, Brian Adkins. We have an incredible guest on today, Matt Zeman, who we go deep into psychedelics and why psychedelics are an opportunity for so much healing, so much change in our lives at a time when it was so dearly needed. I can't, oh, it's hard to even uh, know where to begin to say why the show is so important to me and why I think it is going to be really important to you, whether it's PTSD, anxiety, depression, addiction, um, going through grief, uh, you or somebody that you know might be at end of life. There are so many use cases for psychedelics. And Matt is one of the foremost experts that helps understand I, geez, uh, what do you do with all that? He really unravels it. We unraveled it together. So let me um, introduce Matt. Matt Zeman is an entrepreneur, educator, leader in psychedelic wellness, and the best selling author of two books, including Psychedelics for Everyone. He is the co founder of Happy, a mental wellness company, co founder of Psychable, an online community around psychedelics, consultant to the medical community. And more. Welcome, Matt. I'm so happy to have Andrew, you. Andrew, Joanna, show. it's great to be here. Thank you. Matt, psychedelics are very personal to you. I got that in reading your book. Uh, you start your book with five beautiful, revealing stories, one that was especially raw. Uh, you transformed your life through psychedelics and you dedicated yourself to helping others to do so. What is the top experience you had that caused you to go all in? on psychedelics. Yeah. Okay. So the one that caused me to go all in is the first one. Um, I mean, that first, I went into this as a non-drug user, as a really kind of low expectations. And to reconnect with my mom who died when I was 22 and she was 49, to have this feeling of her being there was just, I, I can't even tell you how how incredible um, that felt and to be able to kind of pull a string from her to me to my kids and understand that I'm carrying her forward and they're carrying us forward and that she's not gone, she's just moved, totally changed my world. Um, in that same experience, I had this feeling of incredible safety and love and that felt so warm and incredible. And then I realized, oh my goodness, I don't feel safe and loved in my everyday life. Why not? And all in a number of other things. But when I left that experience, I wanted to know what is this medicine? How does this work scientifically? What's going on in the, in the sacred realm? And that led to the, the master's in psychology and neuroscience focused on mental health and psychedelics. And that also led to traveling around the world, trying psychedelics from Taitas and shamans and MDs and PhDs and just trying to learn more. So that first one brought me all in and everything since then has just been a part of the journey. Well, let me just even rewind. You talk about in your book about wailing at her mm. wedding and it was so visceral for me. Uh, I mean, you know, let's say all of us eventually lose a both parents, right? And and the exam the experiences can vary, um, but it sounded like for you at the tender age of twenty two to lose your mom, and then as you described it further, that it, you were completely unmoored, and that the amount of grief that you experienced was extraordinarily profound. Yeah, I think my we my sister and I, who I'm super close with, when we lost our, our father, I guess I was nineteen. Our grandmother oh. the year before that, our great aunt before that. Oh. So we'd gone through, we were familiar Ooh, with A lot death. of grief. Mm -hmm. A lot of grief. But there was nothing the same as uh, as our mom dying. It was just, it was such a big deal. She was the the uh, the rock, the safety place, the, the, the person who always told us, you are so loved. Um, and we believed it with, with her and to lose her was a, uh, yeah, I became unmoored. I did not. I lost any faith I had in God at that point. I felt alone in the world, even though we had we had a, a stepfather who cared very much for us. But it wasn't the same as uh, as the relationship we had with our mom. So you um, were so so shattered. And remind me how it was like 
was it like two decades? Yeah, or how a long more was than it? two decades. Okay. So I, I was 22 and then I was 46. So 24 years later is when the psychedelic experience happened. And, um, I, and again, that's why I just in my wildest imagination, I wouldn't have asked for this, couldn't have imagined this. And still I'm like, wow, how lucky am I that I stumbled into this type of tool that had this type of effect on me? Well, and talk a little bit more. So that so the big one you you had that reconnection, and in part I want to. I'm I'm glad you chose that because, oh God, I mean grief is so painful for so many people. And when I think about the different use cases for psychedelics, I just that's not one that I've heard about that much. I've heard more around, um, and and hopefully we'll get to all of these, um, anxiety, depression, uh, addiction, PTSD. But the idea of being able to to heal from such devastating grief is is something that I, I want everybody to know about. And I realize everybody's experience is going to be different. So it's, there's no guarantee that if somebody else does a psychedelic and, trip that they'll reconnect with a loved one like you did. But the fact that that's a possibility um, to me is a really beautiful thing. Um, but I also want you to talk about what else it meant because you describe your childhood as being, you know, pretty, pretty normal. And then, and then in retrospect, um, how you felt, even though your mom said she loved you a lot, like there's this kind of, um, 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 kind of contrariness or something in that story. And in part, I want you to talk about it because I think the vast majority of us say, oh yeah, things were okay. And then, you know, and then when we start to peel away the onion, it's then that the that the healing and the insights can begin because you you felt like you had a pretty normal childhood, but then you realize, oh crap, <laughs> there were problems. So talk about yeah. that, will you? And I def I I'm going. I would love to, and I definitely. But I don't want to forget to come back to that grief thing. So there, there's something there I'd like to jump on to. But let's stay here exactly where you're asking. If you were to ask me at my 42 year old me, how uh, I was fine. Life was fine. My childhood was fine. I had my things, but it was fine. And um, only in doing this work and in this process am I able to look back and be like, oh, not everybody had an alcoholic father. Oh, that isn't fine. Not everybody had this um, played peacemaker because we weren't sure what the next sentence would bring with, with the alcoholism. Um, not everyone felt that, okay, I get that you go to your father's every other weekend and... Because you got divorced at a young age. Yeah, my mom or got your, divorced you, before your parents first grade. Got divorced. Yeah, yeah. And um, but our dad was driving us drunk around, and we knew that was dangerous. But so in retrospect, I know my mom loved me. I know it, and I know she was doing the best she knew how to do. And she wasn't keeping us safe. And that stuff that I was able to just explore, and and again, not with judgment or if that that was bad but understanding that I can feel not safe and feel loved from the same person at the same time. And that was, was really interesting. It has been really interesting to unpack. So I definitely, I put my mom on a pedestal for so many years because again, she was the one who loved me most in the world. And I can look back and be like, hmm. the story is an example that I would tell of her 18 year old, eight, my 18 year old mom getting on a bus in St. Louis to go to New York to make it as a writer. Great, amazing story. And she did it. And she did it. And she left her family and her sisters and her, all our extended family behind as part of that journey. And those are choices. And then that meant we grew up in a world that was much more isolated than my cousins in the, in the Midwest. And I can see that now. And I can understand her choice. And I can understand how that's moved on to us. And I can understand how we, how I <laughs> absorbed that. Um, yeah, but but it's all things I wouldn't have looked at had it not been for these tools. I would love to hear, you said you went and you pursued a master's because you wanted to learn more about it. I would love to hear more about the science of it because I do keep hearing it works for so many people, but I don't understand how. Like, what's happening? So at a, at a high level, it does, and I'm, I'm going to generalize, but at a high level, what it does is it, it turns down your default mode network. So think about your default mode network as that inner narrator that's constantly telling you you're not enough, you need to do more, um, you're not worthy. So it turns that down. So for many people, if just that happened, that's like the weight of the world lifting off your shoulders. 
that feels pretty incredible. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to have neuro, help your brain launch neuro, neurons that haven't fired together in many, many years. They're going to start to fire. So what that looks like, and, and Michael Pollan does a beautiful job explaining this, is it looks like you're, you're skiing down a mountain or sledding down a mountain. And as we get older, we get in the same tracks over and over and over till we forget that we have the rest of this track to ski down. The psychedelics puts a fresh coat of powder. And for those four, five, six hours, oh my goodness, I forgot I could think this way. I don't need to think about my relationship with food or money or my partner or my boss or my kids this way. I can think of it that way. So that's okay. really lovely. Well, I was going to say that really aligns with, I listened to Neil Brennan's podcast a lot. He's amazing. And he was talking about his experience. He talks about it a lot, his experience with psychedelics. And he said that he didn't know that his brain like did positivity. He thought his brain <laughs> just did crabbiness, depression, anxiety, whatever it was. And then he experienced one of these um, uh, psychedelic medicines. And he said, my brain was giving me positivity. And I was like, it's there. And then he said he was able to go out and sort of pluck the positivity once he understood it was there and bring it into his daily life. So what you're saying about these grooves that our brains get into, that that makes sense. It's like, oh, it's there. I can go out of that groove. Does that feel right? It feels right on. And, and actually, you've just moved us in. We can come back to the science, but you've just moved us into the integration. So what I say all the time is psychedelics aren't a cure for anything. They are a catalyst. These are catalysts that help us awake. They help us remember. They remember that we're loved. They remember that we're enough. Remember that we're worthy. With that information, and, and sorry, remember that we don't have to think in the repetitive thinking patterns that we've been doing. With that information, we can then look at how are we living our lives? How are we living in relationship? How are we not living in relationship? And without shame, blame, or guilt, we can do that without being bad me. I'm just is. Oh, I want to feel connected. Hmm, my beha behaviors are disconnecting me from these people that I love. I need to shift my behavior. Great. What then happens is we get into what we call integration. What happens after for all these days when we're not on medicine? And that's where working with coaches, working with a therapist, working in a, getting into a community of support becomes so important. Um, where people develop contemplative practices, they develop meditation, they any of these types of techniques to help keep our mind on that positive, to help us live in alignment with the awareness that we had on the psychedelic. And that's where we start optimizing these experiences. Well, what I love about just ugh, what you're doing, and thank you for going all in and your beautiful book and the work that you're doing. Um, I, I'm going to also quote from Michael Pollan, who wrote um, the famous book, How to Change Your Mind. And and spoiler alert, but it's worth it. Read it anyway if you haven't, along with uh, Matt's book. Um, that the experience of of for him, and he he talks about just like you with multiple different experiences with psychedelics, uh, LSD and psilocybin and ayahuasca and so forth. Um, that the experience of of just profound love and connection. I mean, ultimately, and it's like our world here at your Tango and Open Relationships. It's all about love. And that point to me can't be overstated. And I know it's what you emphasized in your first accidental, uh, if you will, psychedelic experience, that feeling of just such profound love. And, and I know a lot of people feel like, oh, it's so fruity. And it's like, and it's just so like hippy dippy. But when I think about what you're saying about the catalyst and, and Joanna, what you're saying about, um, um, uh, Brennan is Neil Brennan is once you once you can experience that feeling and know it is in your brain and it is possible for you to feel such a profound sense of love and connectedness and that then by but by, by having the um, the taste of that that you're willing to do the work to to have at least something something more closer to that right I realize maybe not everybody's going to live in bliss all the time. Uh, but just it does strike me as though having an experience of that is a profound gift. And when I think about, oh, my God, how much hurt there is in our world. I mean, PTSD is practically normalized. Uh, deep depression is normalized. Anxiety is normalized. Um, addiction is normalized. Like 
we're in a, a loneliness epidemic. And so when I think about these medicines uh, being uh, opportunities for so many people to heal, I, I mean, I am so passionately uh, for more education and, and access and so forth. And it just, it feels like we're, we're at the very beginning of a very big renaissance. Well, that's yeah. what I wanted to ask a question about being at the beginning. So I am, um, I don't drink, I don't use any drugs. I smoked marijuana, uh, like once or twice in college and I thought I was dying. Like, I'm just now, I'm so sensitive. I'm not wired like that, but I do take Zoloft. I used to take Adderall. So it's not like I'm afraid of putting things in my body. Um, but in my head, in the story that tells me that I shouldn't try this in some way is if it can change your brain for the better, it could change your brain for the worse. Am I, where am I on that? Where are we on that? <laughs> These are powerful medicines and I don't want to, I, I don't even, I try not to even use the word safe. I use risk reduced. So we can talk about science has pretty much agreed that for the most part, these are physiologically risk reduced. They are non-addictive. Um, I, I refer to, and I'm, I'm going to take us around the block here, I refer to Dr. David Nutt from Imperial College in London who said, all drugs are dangerous. So let's forget how they're classified and just look at risk, harm to self and harm to others. And when he put his chart together in the far left-hand side of 72, the most dangerous to self and others was alcohol. And then you move down, you get to heroin, you get to tobacco, you move all the way and down the And by the, the way, chart. Matt, I'm going to just interrupt. We actually have that visual because I found it. And Brian, for those of you who are watching the podcast, you'll get to see it. For those of you who aren't, we'll try to link it in the show notes, but it's dramatic. So keep, keep keep going with your explanation for those of you. I love that you're showing it. it. Yeah, it's I mean it's amazing that you get down yeah. to the far right. You get to um, mushrooms are a six, LSD is a seven, um, MDMA, MDMA is a nine. So all these drugs have the ability to be dangerous. What does Johns Hopkins talk about with their research? They say if you pay attention to source, where do your drugs come from, your set and your setting, the probability of having a, a truly bad trip is very 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 low. So can these cause harm? Of course they can. And can they be good? Of course they can. And, and, and the work that I do is how do we occasion by factors of a high, high probability, meaningful, positive experiences for people. Um, and, and we're doing that. I think people, we, we're doing that in all the ways that people meet psychedelics in America. There's a medical model, there's a decriminalization model, and there's a religious freedom model. And all three areas are, are focused on this, the same goal of, of making sure these are not bad experiences that harm people. It does feel like because alcohol is legal, and this is something I've been talking about for a long time, I've lost two people in my life very young to alcohol. And I come from a family of, of addiction. Andrea also comes from a family of addiction and alcohol being legal. It's amazing the bias we have toward alcohol and the bias we have against something like a plant medicine because of that. And alcohol is, there's basically no safe amount that you can drink on a regular basis. It's bad for your liver. It's a it's a known carcinogen. It's It causes so many deaths that we don't even talk about. And yet this these plant medicines that seem to have such a good safety profile, they were made not just illegal, but they couldn't even research them, right? There was a whole time when they, it was like, we almost had to just pretend it didn't exist, right? We did. I mean, How do you, you I grew combat up in this just that? just say no generation. We grew yeah. up with, with, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, nothing, this, there's, you're going to get addicted, you're going to all sorts of bad yep. things are going to happen. It's you're gonna, hard. You're going to die if you smoke I'm, weed one time. That, well, that it didn't I work. Just wanna, yeah. And I just want to chime in. It's like, so I don't think it actually shows in this chart where um, things like SSRIs fall, right? Because to your point, Joanna, I mean, I know SSRIs have saved a lot of people and yet, and and other forms of uh, psychoactive drugs that are prescribed have also been um, the cause of a, a lot of downfall for a lot of people, right? And well, especially so for adolescents. The adolescents mm -hmm. really, and most of them shouldn't be on SSRIs, and they're not exactly innocuous, especially with the adolescent brain. Well, totally. And so I, I feel like, so this idea of how vilified um, uh, due to Nixon, and you know, Matt, I'll let you answer because you're the expert. So 
So how, yeah, I guess, how do we get back from this being completely vilified? Well, and stick on this for just a second. I mean, antidepressants were never meant to be decades long solutions. They were meant to be episodic. And so we just don't have a healthcare system that is able to ramp people off at anywhere near the rate that we're able to ramp people on. And when we think about they only work maybe in 40% of the people who use them, and we know the side effects, we know the weight gain, the lethargy, the suicidal ideation, the sexual dysfunction, and upwards of 70-some percent with SSRIs, those are big price tags to pay. Price tags for relationship with self, relationship with family, all those things. Huge price tags. And to come off of them is hard. So, yeah, we, we don't have candid discussions. People think they have failed the medicine when the medicine has failed them. And we can't even get to ketamine, which is, again, used off-label in all 50 states, legal today, rapid onsets of, of, as, as a solution or as a, as a, um, a way to, to combat depression, combat anxiety, combat suicidal ideation. People are not allowed to go to that until they've done multiple um, uh, of the antidepressants. It's, it's way down on the list and just seems like that's a shame. And is, let that, alone... due to, is that due to um, insurance covering coverage or is it because uh, doctors aren't allowed to uh, point people toward ketamine treatments if they haven't done other forms of uh, treatment? If you want, so for prescription ketamine, which is actually called S-ketamine, it's a Johnson Johnson's product, yes, you have to have failed multiple antidepressants to get insurance to cover it. If um if you're if you have the resources to be able to afford it, um, whenever your doctor is willing to tell you about it or you discover it, you can go and do it. But you're talking about roughly, I don't know, three to five thousand dollars for your first six sessions if you're going in clinic, twelve hundred dollars if you want to do it by telehealth. But you've got to supplement a lot of resources if you go that way. So it's a it's an expensive path, and it's a it just seems unfortunate to me. Um, but even more so when we get into these other medicines, which have even higher levels of efficacy and more um, and less side effects and less risk of addiction um, than ketamine. I mean, ketamine does have, is one of the few psychedelics that does have addiction potential. Is there a way in which, because there's so much research into SSRIs, they've spent so many decades researching and now have decades of data of people who've been taking them, that um, <clears throat> we know more about the side effects than we do about these plant medicines simply because of how many resources have been thrown at researching them? I think that's a fair question, but I think we can also say that indigenous communities and, and of, across the world have used these plant medicines for a long time. And if they had large side effects, if they were particularly dangerous, these cultures would have stopped using them. Um so I think we have that as well. And we have a lot of citizen scientists that aren't reporting these side effects from these uh, these psychedelic medicines. Yeah. And that seems like another downfall of the policies that that criminalized research into these because we it's not a one for one. There's not an equal comparison between, you know, uh, ayahuasca and and Zoloft. Not that they'd be prescribed for the same thing because they weren't even allowed to do the research. Right. So. Or when they did, I've heard uh, people bring that up, and it's always like, well, what did you want people to do? <laughs> Dr. Carl Hart has a beautiful book on this called Drug Use for Growing Up. So he's a um, addiction specialist, Columbia professor, 20 years or 20 plus years. And uh, and he talks about this flywheel between, okay, the government said this is going to be bad. They put a lot of money into academia where they would hire people who would publish papers about drugs are bad that then got pu published by the press, drugs are bad, then enforced by the police and reinforced by society. Propaganda. And it was a circle. It's just straight up propaganda. It's, well, let me just jump in there. You say in your book, after 50 years of criminalization and demon demonization, psychedelic drugs are about to enter mainstream psychiatry, psych psychiatry and launch the most significant advancement in mental health treatment since the creation of the SSRI in 1974. Right? So when we talk about we are at the beginning of a renaissance. There is, so, to me, especially sitting here in a loneliness epidemic and a mental health crisis, there is so much room for, for hope and optimism. And um, Joanna, I'm so glad as somebody who's so educated and so open-minded that you already started by saying, ooh, I'm not sure about this for me, right? That's why I wanted to get you on the show, Matt, because I just feel like people have been talking about uh, the sort of resurgence of psychedelics since 
20, what did John Hopkins started the, uh, like 2011, maybe? Sure. I mean, it's been, earlier, but yeah. you know, yeah. So like 15 years and now just in these last three, four, it feels four or five, maybe when Michael Pollan's book mm-hmm. came out, that there's been this in sense of inevitability, but I, I know I'm really open to it. And so I want to put on my hat that says I'm not open to it and help educate people and, and even though your book says psychedelics for everyone, everybody, <laughs> they're not for everybody, uh, but there are a lot of people that can benefit from it. Um, so let's just let's just rewind a little bit. What are the problems that psychedelics treat the most effectively? So, so um, psychedelics for everyone. Of course, not everyone should take a psychedelic. They're good for society is my point by that. So whether it's for you, whether it's for someone you love, or whether it's just information for how you vote, I think educating after 50 years of prohibition, getting the information to make an informed decision is what this piece is about. And for many of us, it's going to be like, I don't need to take a psychedelic. Great. That's beautiful. I'm going to go run. I'm going to do meditation. I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. Great. And others will. With, um, oh my goodness, I just totally lost track of the question. Oh, uh, what problems Thank are, you. what are the problems yes. that uh, psychedelic treats most effectively? So there's over 300 academic institutions studying psychedelics, and they're really looking at anything that involves repetitive thinking patterns. So what does that mean? Well, we can, that can, that can manifest as depression. It can manifest as anxiety, can manifest as an eating disorder, can manifest as a gambling addiction. It can manifest um, as a substance use challenge, on and on and on. And that's where it seems like such a wide net that this, the research is looking at, but at the core, it's just how are we as individuals manifesting this particular pattern. They're even researching, I know this is not a behavioral thing, but there's research now with autism and psychedelics, University of Toronto, Imperial College. There's a group out of Colorado that every week there's, there's, a, there's a call for people with autism with psychedelics. Once a month, it's, they invite their parents to come on. It's fascinating. So when we think about all the ways that we manifest our, our, um, our programming, it can look like a lot of different things. We're just funny as a culture. If, in our culture, it seems to me that if, if, if you look at a, somebody who's got a substance use challenges, oh, well, that's, that's awful. They're a drug addict. But we don't feel that way when we look at somebody who's a workaholic. Oh, wait, they're on the cover of the magazine. Yay them. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, we talk about we we are we are uh, merciless when it comes to being honest about workaholism. <laughs> yeah, G- Andrea and I are honest mm-hmm. about the fact that we are achievement junkies. That we <laughs> both always like to have a full calendar and a lot of success. Uh-huh. And, well, and, and, and in all seriousness, so it I mean it comes at a big I mean big effing cost. I mean I'm a mother of two amazing kids, and I I have reformed a lot. But in all seriousness, I mean, having come from a family with um, alcoholism, deadly, literally deadly eating disorders, workaholism, you know, many more uh, uh, um, in that in that realm. Um, when I think about what was safe for me to to do as a as a way of controlling and and proving proving myself, I mean, workaholism was the safest. But it is it's real. I mean, the the price that I've paid and that, you know, I'm I'm glad that I can say that I'm I've been learning to forgive myself and be more empathetic. But it is like there is no escape. I mean, there is if you you know, you can get help through things like psychedelics and meditation and psychotherapy and so forth. But I I just when I hear, uh, you know, like eat like that kind of is a way to um be proud of yourself. And and sure, you know, beautiful things have occurred because people are willing to work hard. But I don't want to give any of us who are workaholics a pass because I feel like it is it is so ultimately problematic. Well, but- and I think we also, we you know, we list off all these things that, you know, addictions, alcohol, all these different drugs. We also have compulsive behaviors around so many things in our society. Let's just say extramarital affairs like this the data behind how many people are doing that, a lot of times that kind of cheating behavior is a compulsive behavior, like stalking, even just there's, they all fall under compulsive behavior. So you're really blowing my mind when you're saying that it's a repetitive thought pattern that can be broken. And the benefit that that can can serve for people who are stuck, I can't stop thinking about this other person in my relationship. I can't stop thinking about this person that hates me over here at work. I can't stop. 
when we look at it that way and not just a diagnosis, if you could interrupt some of that, that could be life-changing. I can see right in front of my face how many people could have their lives change if they didn't have to be obsessive or compulsive about behaviors. And you can, and then you start stacking these things up. So let's let's just take that in sequence. Step stack one. Wow, I don't have to think about this the way I've been thinking about it. That's amazing. Then we go back to what Andrea's talking about. Oh my goodness, we are all connected. We might look like different waves, but we're all part of the same ocean. Huh? That's pretty cool. I'm not as lonely as I thought I was. Then a step further. Wow, I'm not separate and apart from nature. I am nature. That's blowing my mind. I can't even believe that. So all this thing that this whole beautiful world that's around me, this ground that I'm standing on is supporting me. I didn't think of it as as yet another layer of support in my life, but now I have that. So then, oh, wow. And I've been telling myself this story. I need to go win my parents' love who are dead. What am I doing? I need to do this to earn their approval. Why am I doing that? Um, and on and on. And now I've broken that. So then what do I want to do with this? Um, it's, it, I think it's so free. I think this, this medicine can be so freeing as, again, as a catalyst, not a cure, for coming to those awarenesses. Um, and then I'll just, I'll just say one more and I'll stop. One more, just because it ties to this particular piece on judgment and, and the ability to look at, a, at an alcoholic one way and somebody who smokes is another and someone who overeats is another. This idea that we're all the same on the inside that at our core, we are all the same. What then happens is we behave differently, but at our essence is the same. And I think that's a realization that I didn't understand um, until Well, and you talk so beautifully me. too about um, just going back to your book and, and some of those really personal stories. You talked so bravely about, oh God, it just chokes me up, about uh, being in a kind of a sexually abusive relationship as a young person, a teenager, and then and with an older person in your family and how you were able to forgive her and forgive yourself, which, I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of people who are, are victims of sexual abuse. You talk about having a neurodivergent daughter, and and it just sounds like what a, what a beautiful gift to understand her better. Uh, I love the part when, you know, you're talking about your older son who won. Uh, this is cute. Um, your son asked you, uh, if he could watch you do drugs. By the way, I don't like talking about psychedelics as drugs. <laughs> you know, I feel like they're different than heroin and, you know, cocaine. But yes, I realize it's a drug. And just so your stories from grief to parenting to your own self-love and forgiveness, it, those different use cases, and I'm, I'm shouting those out right now for our, my audience, our audience, because in addiction to in addition to the depression and suicidal ideation and addiction that we've been talking about i really i really want everybody listening to say "Ooh, that 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 might be i i might be more open to it now whether it's for me or somebody that i know two of my very closest friends have benefited greatly from uh ketamine treatment like really benefited from it so it just again i i you know when i think about how much um how much um misinformation there is out there and fear and taboo, you know, my hope is just increasingly as more and more people hear about the benefits and being aware of the of, of the risks, but also recognizing that especially with um, uh, mitigating factors with psilocybin and MDMA and, and ketamine and so forth, that the that typically the benefits way, way away the risks. Um, but the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say, is there a point at which it can be used too much? Like, is there a way in which I, I know we're talking about it doesn't? It's not technically addictive, but is there a way in which we could become compulsive about its use or maladaptive? In that, instead of dealing with our crap that we need to deal with, we think we can just go back for another dose. I love this question because it gets into kind of our nature of human nature. So are there people who use psychedelics as a vehicle to escape? And it's no different than I took a trip to Japan last weekend and wow, that was different. And then I go right back into my everyday life. Absolutely. Absolutely. It happens all the time. Yeah, we Should can be maladaptive about anything. We can be course. maladaptive about 
flirting with the person down the road. We can be maladaptive about eating cookies. Yes. Yes. So it happens. It happens all the time. What, um, and there's actually, there is a divide in the, in the scientific community. There are some medical professionals who believe this is a biochemical reaction. Put the ketamine in the body, feel the effects, move on with your life. And there's other medical professionals who believe it's a biochemical, psychosocial, spiritual process. Set your intention, gather your resources, come through a guided experience, integrate afterwards all these different things that have happened, find your community, find your positive behaviors, turn your mind for the positive. It's a philosophical difference. We are seeing UNC, University of North Carolina up the road, got a $27 million grant from the Department of Defense to remove the hallucinogenic properties of psychedelics. I don't oh. know if that's possible. Oh, no. I, I did yeah, thumbs bad. up, not doing thumbs down. I was like, <laughs> right. $27 Big million number. for research. Nope, not that guy. But to remove that process, to, to try to shortcut the process. So um, it seems like it, it would be interesting to see the research when you take out the hallucinogenic property, at least the research to find out, does it still do its job? Yeah. Yeah. Could it still that impact the default mode network? Seems interesting. But mm-hmm. yeah, like if the, what they're, I think, I think what you're saying is it wouldn't do its job. <laughs> Why are you even trying? But I can sort of see where that would go. And I want to clarify something else. So I, as I said, I take Zoloft and Dr. Chris Palmer really blew my mind. He's a Harvard psychiatrist. I'm sure you know him where I was listening to him talk about, um, what we misunderstand about mental illness. And my grandmother was institutionalized. She had electroshock therapy. She had horrible medications. I had horrible side effects before the SSRI. It was a terrible life. It it was not good, no matter how hard she tried. So when I think about Zoloft for me, I think about this legacy in my family, and I'm grateful to have this drug. But Dr. Chris Palmer uh, on, I don't remember which interview it was, was saying that SSRI is not treating your depression because we don't know where the depression starts and we don't really know what the SSRI has to do with it. We know that some people feel better, but it's not treated in that if you go off of that medication, it will probably come back. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking, uh, yeah. Julia, that different from what you were describing, uh, Matt, as a philosophical difference. To me, I would actually say less, phil- I mean, philosophical too, but as a practical matter where um, there's a lot of evidence that shows in taking the um, psychedelics, you know, appropriately, uh, thinking about source, set, and setting, that you can um, achieve lasting change. And that, that is not typically what um, occurs with an SSRI. And it I seems wanna... like part of that is the integration. That there's almost like maybe there's other treatments. Like you're if you start on that SSRI and you're not making all of the other changes in your life to integrate once you have that opportunity, maybe that's missing all around in mental health too. You know, we can learn something from what the what they're doing with psychedelics. The research... There's a lot of research that says most episodes resolve. So when we talk about treatment-resistant depression, treatment-resistant anxiety, what is happening? And then with the antidepressants, we talk about numbing symptoms versus getting to that root and moving on. What I love about the power of these tools, these psychedelics when used in a medical model or in theogens in a spiritual, is we're getting to the core. We're getting to the foundation. And the person who's driving that chain themselves is saying, I'm taking responsibility and I'm taking the power back to do this work myself. And I don't need to be told the answer. I'm going to go find the answer inside of me. And then I can work with a therapist. I can work with a coach. I can join a community to help me think through this, to help me apply words to this incredible experience. But I'm doing this. I'm taking this myself and moving forward. And I, and I, I think that's, I think taking back our agency in a culture where we're taught at a very young age to give our agency up to our medical professionals, our teachers, our bosses, this is powerful. And, and uh, we talk about the, the kids. I have an 18 and 20 year old who are swimming in this soup of, I need to change the way the world interacts with me to find my happiness. And it's like, it's like I'm not feeling well. I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to get a prescription for you, Joanna. No, I, get to, I need to take this back and change myself for the road that's ahead versus trying to change the road if I want lasting happiness, if I want lasting... Con- Content, uh, contentness in this world. 
if I keep trying to change the world, it's a moving target. And I may always be disappointed. Well, totally. And I mean, not yeah, I'm a proud capitalist as an entrepreneur. But when I think about things like um, the impact of social media on our lives and and technology and consumer, you know, hyper consumerism, that is, I predict that's only going to get worse. So if anything, Matt, what I hear you saying is because the world is only going to get more, more and more is going to be thrown at us in terms of what we can watch, what we can eat, where we can go. Um, you know, there's just going to be that much more. And then you add AI and it all multiplies by like a billion. Right. So rather than trying to change and, and navigate all that to say, ooh, I am going to um, I am going to be wise and 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 calm and open and all the things that that psychedelics can help people do um, rather than trying to change the environment around me. Like I'm going to, I'm going to show up differently. And to me, that is a profound way of, of reclaiming your agency. Absolutely. And I'm, I think I'm going to play with one more thing on top of what you're saying, Andrew, because I, I love this. I, I, I know for me, I grew up in a culture of scarcity. There's not enough. I need to work hard. I need to take what's mine. If I don't work hard, I'm not going to succeed. If I don't do more, I'm not going to succeed. What I'm seeing in, again, these journeys is, oh my goodness, no, no, no. This is a culture of abundance. What I'm seeing with AI and what I'm seeing with this point in time in history is we have never been more secure in terms of food, in terms of housing, in terms of, again, are there violence in different parts of the world? Of course there are. But relatively, it's lower than any other time in history. So we are alive in the richest time. Our kids are alive where they are so not worried about about yeah, food salmon. and shelter. They can yeah, think about the most all these other things. Okay. So now what are we going to do moving forward? If we're not worried about surviving, how do we want to live in this world? Who do we want to live in this world with? And what is that going to look and feel like? What an incredible time to be alive. Yeah, I agree. And that's why I feel excited about this as a renaissance, because at the same time, as you speak those words, uh, there, there is, it is um, inarguable that there's a loneliness epidemic, that there's a mental health crisis, that there are so many signals that are showing how totally dissatisfied uh, so many people are. I mean, it, the Pew research is insane. I'm going to get it wrong with the exact number, but I'll get it mostly right. Like one out of four Americans don't have a close friend, right? I mean, there are so many things that are happening due to technology, um, uh, you know, it's like I, I like to joke that if you have a credit card and an Amazon account, you don't need another person in your life. Right. And so so it's like people have been made redundant. And so when I think about the default mode network dampening and, and sort of dampening that that critic inside of us and the, the person that's judging and so forth, and that something in the psychedelics open us up to understand that we are part of a greater whole, that we are love. Right. For people to get a, a taste of that, to me, back to your point of what a what a wonderful time to be alive. And and it's also why, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that um, that uh, people like you and and that are legislators across you know states and, and you know, um, nationally and, and so forth will continue to take down barriers. Because one of the things that I was going to ask you is. What is the number one hurdle for all these, I mean, really amazing outcomes that are occurring for people that I know, for you, for people? I mean, story after story talks about these incredible outcomes. And yet, m m most most places people live, it is illegal to, to take psilocybin. It is illegal to take, you know, and, uh, yes, ketamine is approved. Um, MDMA, you know, fingers crossed, should be approved um, for legal use later this summer. But the vast majority of places, you're really not supposed to be taking this. So, like, that's a big problem. What do we do? What do you, I mean? What do you recommend? I mean, so there. So I would divide this this exact question into two buckets, really three buckets. There's the medical bucket, the decriminalization bucket, and the religious bu bucket. The medical bucket is, I prefer to have a diagnosis and to have a medical professional with licensure work with me with psychedelics. Beautiful. We need to find ways to get them educated, to give them training, and to um, and to help that model expand using these different tools. And if we focus on MDMA and psilocybin as the next two logical ones, 
but there's other tools behind that that are in this psychedelic playbook. That's the medical model. The decriminalization model says no adult should tell another adult that they can't put nature in their body. That's a very libertarian perspective. But they're also saying it's not fair that if I can't afford the medical model that I don't have access to these drugs. So we need them decriminalized so people can have access. Okay, that's beautiful. The third is this religious freedom. People saying, we are a country founded on religious freedom. We had Quakers Amen, locked up and in and, mm -hmm. and jails. And they came here to practice using just one. And, and all many religions came here because they had the freedom. So we now have 200 to 2,000, somewhere in that zone, psychedelic churches in America. We need a way to get them what's called an exemption. So that they're not just relying on the statute and the law of religious freedom, rest, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. They actually have an exemption from our government to be able to practice legally. Why? Because in the old days, we just had healers. And the healers were spiritual healers and medical healers. We have divided that. And I'm sorry, one healer did both roles. We have divided that into two different roles in Western society. So, and it's fair to say, okay, if we gave psychedelics to the clergy, they don't have the latest knowledge of the brain and the body to keep us safe. Fair enough. But conversely, if we give it all the power to the doctors and we occasion these spiritual experiences, they don't have the training to help me unpack whatever the heck just happened spiritually. So we need a reconciliation. We need a collaboration. And the only way for that to happen is all of this to come above ground and to have open and honest discussions across medical and spiritual and these collaborations which reduce costs, these collaborations which open up access, these collaborations which make it possible for people who want to diagnose us and people who don't want to diagnose us to have access to these tools yeah. that save lives. Do you feel like, I feel like at this point, there's there's like a battle between the people who are psychiatry and people who are plant medicine. So it's a weird false binary, but how do how do we integrate these two in so it doesn't have to be one or the other? Love that. I mean, there's these doctors are humans, and these doctors grew up with a scarcity mindset just like we grew up. And we see in the ketamine space, as an example, we do see infighting between the anesthesiologists. We studied ketamine the most and the psychiatrists, but we do mental health the most versus the psychologist therapist. But we work with the people the most. And they have three different mindsets in, in many cases. We do see these, these plant medicine, spiritual, indigenous communities saying, but wait a minute, we never stopped. When you all took a break, we kept serving the medicine. We kept doing the work. And if you take this from us, that's stealing. That's colonialism. That's not okay. And I believe at our core, we all, we, we all want... Um, we all want the healing. We all want the learning. We all want the growing. We know, and I'm just going to pick on veterans for a moment, 30,000 veterans have taken their own lives since 9-11, four times the amount that have died in combat. That's why we're seeing Republicans and Democrats linking arms to find tools for veterans. That's why we're seeing conservative and liberal donors donating to these causes. So I believe at our core, we all want the same thing. We don't want anyone to hurt. We don't want anyone to take their lives. We just have to keep reminding people there's enough for everybody. There's enough that you can practice your medical practice and there'll be plenty of work for you. And there's enough um, for the spiritual practice. There's plenty of work for you. And there's enough for a decriminalization model as well. And it's, it's just an and and it's a collaboration. There's reason to be optimistic, right? Because, because, and you know, when you talk about the likes of Johns Hopkins and NYU and some of the most prestigious uh, research universities in the world who are showing real efficacy, right? And then, you know, Oregon uh, has uh, legalized, I mean, I think all, all drugs. Um, my, I'm proud. I'm, I don't live in Denver, but a proud Coloradan, you know, that Denver has legalized psilocybin. So I, I do feel optimistic, but there is still a gap. So I love how you talk about the site that you guys developed, psychable, P-S-Y-C-H-A-B-L-E.com, psychable.com is like Yelp for psychedelics. Is that what you would recommend? So let's say a, a mom who's worried about her son or a dad who's worried about himself or, you know, a young man who's worried about himself or, you know, you name it, like whatever that scenario is, somebody says, oh man, I got to try this. Where do they go? Do they go to psychable.com? Do they go to mattzeman.com? What can they do today after listening to this and saying, I need to learn more? I need to 
satisfy myself that it's right for me. And if it is, then how do I get a clean and safe source? And how do I make sure somebody who is not a quack and not a charlatan will be a good guide for me? The questions that we as consumers have to ask are the same questions, whether we're looking at a medical model, a spiritual model, or a psychedelic tourism model. We're going to fly somewhere and do these things. We need to ask about where is the source of the medicine? Where does it come from? If it's medical, it's the pharmacy. Great. But if it's any of these other people, how often do you do it? Do you have the same source? Do you test your medicine? What is the, the going to set? What are the rules? Are you going to touch me? Are you going to talk to me? Are we going to how, Who's going to be in here? Are you doing a health evaluation of me? Or are you giving me an informed consent? All of the, Are you going to help me uh, set my intentions, prepare my resources? All of that leads to the mindset of the person going in. And then the setting is obviously the physical environment. Um, and what are, the, are you going to provide music? Are there mattresses? Are there 20 people? Are there 100 people? Are there two people? What is it, what's it going to feel like? Are they going to be interrupted by Amazon, by kids, by dogs? What is it? Um, we need to ask those questions as consumers because, and I'm going to use ketamine, legal ketamine, all 50 states. There are some providers where you go in, they put an IV in your arm, they take your vitals, and then they send you away when you're finished. And there's other providers which they do this whole experience, including therapy or coaching on both sides. Both are legal. Not saying either is wrong, but we as a consumer need to ask. Same thing with the psychedelic tourism. There are retreats out there that do 100 people at a time, and there are retreats out there that do 10 or 20 people at a time. Both are can be beautiful, but they're very different. What do you want? What are you getting? And know before you plop down that kind of money. I'm going to back us up to health intakes. Our doctors, for the most part, they might not be as educated on this specific, the interactions with psychedelics. So I love like Ben Malcolm, Dr. Ben Malcolm, spiritpharmacist.com. You can go to him. He has nothing to sell you besides information. And do your own health intake based on who you are, your prescriptions, your supplement, your background, your family history, and find out what are the risks that are known and unknown about whatever psychedelic you're uh, considering. Emily Culpa, Dr. Emily Culpa does the same thing. There's a psychedelic pharmacist Hang on, what's association. What's her name? You're talking fast. Emily, Emily Culpa, K U L P A, also does psychedelic intake. Emily Culpa, okay. Um, I'm glad you're saying all this because it does seem like there are some people, like the way the way I've seen it for myself is with my family history of pretty serious mental illness, if I'm functioning okay and my life is good and I'm happy, I feel like I'm not going to go in and mess with all that. Like, is there something I'm missing? Are there other people who really shouldn't take psychedelics? People who don't have a firm grasp of reality in this world are not really a good candidate to go jump into that world. So that can look like schizophrenia, can look like active mania for someone who's bipolar, can look like uh, just different types of uh, psychotic personalities. Um, I can say- What about adolescents? Because we know with adolescents, like the more they're learning about early marijuana use, even early alcohol use, um, we talked about SSRIs, adolescent brains seem to work differently. Um, Would you, would you recommend people considering this for 16, 17, 18, up to 22 year olds? Or is that something we don't know enough about? I'm conflicted in this space, and here's why. In indigenous culture, when we talk about those types of medicines, let's go with just ayahuasca and psilocybin and iboga. Those communities using those tools have done that with their youth for a long time. So my inclination is it's probably okay for in the right setting um, for those tools. We know that the average person in America who tries a psychedelic is like 14, so they're doing it anyhow. And we're not seeing a flood of emergency rooms with that. We are seeing, conversely though, we are seeing psychotic breaks with cannabis with the, because of the THC concentration today. It's just a very different medicine than it was 30 years ago. But we are seeing a massive, it's hard when we're talking about adolescents because it's hard to tease out the different factors. We know they're using way more concentrated THC than they ever have at higher rates than ever. We also know that they have very high or, um, rates of depression, anxiety. Suicide rates are skyrocketing. I just, just for context, I just finished writing a book about teenage boys. So I have all this research in my head that it is hard to tease it out because we could say, oh, they're trying psychedelics younger and they don't have these emergency room visits. It's so confounded with so much else that it's hard to tease apart what's causing the problems with these young people. We, we point right at social media, but we aren't 
also looking at the other factors in their lives. It seems like there's a lot of different things, you know, a ton of it's, different it things is, that... it is really scary that, that so many young people are using hallucinogenic medicament, you know, things, including marijuana without any supervision and very little research. And they have been, though, is my point. They have the, the, this, the age hasn't gotten younger. It's just been it. It's consistent. What, but what we I think what's different the concentration with, of THC has gotten that's a gone whole different way, thing. way, that, way up. And it's all called cannabis. And if you don't understand enough about strains and THC concentrations, you can end up in the ER in a blink of an eye. The um, what's also interesting about this particular generation is, OK, they've grown up with school shootings which has got, I just can't imagine what that feels like. And I know like my parents' generation grew up with the, the nuclear bomb threats of get under the desk and that had to be scary, but school shootings- And they were seems, scarred by it. They just didn't talk about it. They didn't talk about <laughs> it. And the school yeah. shootings seem so real and it seems, and, um, and they still have the threat of nuclear war and we, oh, well, maybe North Korea is going to fire a missile today. What? What are you talking about? Yeah, it's, it's very real. So they, they have those things happening. We have two parents working. We have lack of institutions. We're not going to church. We're not going to community events. So we, and we're moving our friendships into these online um, communities. It's there's beautifulness and that we can stay connected. When we move and there's there's isolation. No, our this. our social fabric is breaking down. There's no question between the use of social media, the use of you know I, I like to wave my phone. These weapons of mass distraction, you know <laughs> hyper hyper capitalism. You know, we so there's no question in my mind that and again, the the hopefulness in me uh, as as this occurs and let's face it, um, uh, climate change is a is a real Mm. threat and And uh, concern for most of us, I think, um, that to think there there, you know, the earth is giving us um, medicine to to learn how to reconnect as human beings and to recognize how one we are with each other and the planet, right? It's like just like just at the right time. But I want to go back to one uh, cohort of people that I'm I'm curious with your thoughts are. When I look at the research, it seems like the people most at risk um, uh, for for loneliness and then you know certainly around uh, suicide and so forth are um, older you know elderly single men. And then, you know, youngish, let's call them, you know, 20 something year old men. Do you feel like and I'm going to give um, uh, shouts out to Brian, our producer, who shared a little a little clip on age three with Brittany Broski talking about how how so many young men are averse to therapy, but they are. Um, in fact, do you want to run the clip real quick, Brian? Yeah, you're ready. You got it. You got it ready for me. All right. Cool. Thanks. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. People be like, mushrooms changed my, maybe, and I'm, not to say that, that it didn't, but I mean, it's that, not that big of a deal. That meme that's like, men do shrooms one time and discover empathy. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. I had an ego death, bro. Life is so fragile. Oh, You've discovered empathy. Yeah. You've discovered caring for another human. Yeah. Congrats. Welcome. Well, hey, a breakthrough's a breakthrough. Happy to have you. <laughs> Welcome to the planet. Well, welcome to the show. And they're and they're being sarcastic, but it, it did really stop me in my tracks when I think about who's at risk, who is probably the least open to, uh, you know, traditional psychotherapy kind of, um, uh, you know, psychotherapy sessions and so forth. But the idea of saying, "Hey, I can," and again, I, I appreciate what you were saying before. It's a catalyst. It's not a cure all. But do you feel like? Young men potentially are are the cohort that have the um, greatest to gain potentially from greater adoption of of safe of of uh, I, I don't want to use the word safe of using psychedelics responsibly. Is that a is that a kind of a thesis it's, you would buy on uh, buy um, onto? Sure, it's a massively important demographic. Uh, but I, I think to, let's let's go to research for a minute and then come back to here. So when Johns Hopkins says, "What is the likelihood of having a a outcome that is positive and that is sustaining for a large period of time?" And they equate that to the connection with the mystical experience that something happened on this journey that was a reconnection with our sacred, was a reconnection with the interconnectedness that you were talking about before, Andrea, and the stronger that experience, the more, the length of time that this sticks. Um, 
I think and then you know it's possible. I mean, to me, like that's the big thing. Me. Like, ooh, this is like it gives you a taste of the possibility, which to me it just feels like even if it doesn't stick, that you would you would understand that that is possible inside of you. All right, go ahead. So I'm with you. So then I so I think about this entire generation where they're looking at the cost of things in the world um, and saying, "Wow, I can't ever afford that house." Or it's, I'm not buying that house in my 20s, 30s, or 40s. Maybe when my parents die, I'll get the house. But I can't do it. I can't play that game. That game no longer works. And um, and I think that impacts the entire generation. The climate control, I don't know what bothers me. What or Climate change bothers me only in that uh, we. I don't think we talk. Ab- yes, hugely problematic. And we are an adaptive species. So yes, you might not be able to eat this. We're going to eat that. We not people but I, live but here. Matt, I agree with you. I am. I, by the way, you and I are like perennial optimists. But I, I think there is a <laughs> large cohort of people who don't share our optimism and who, who you know, feel like between the temperature going up and the number of tornadoes and you know, and these like terrible natural disasters getting worse, rightfully a sense of anxiety pervades. You know, even if rationally, you know, you and I could explain, oh, we're probably going to make it better. But maybe not, right? So I just, I guess I'm speaking to the, you know, there being kind of this general anxiety that is troubling a lot of young people because this is what they're inheriting. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually agreeing with you. I, so I'm saying I have this perspective and I understand this perspective of, of the youth and of the, of the elderly. And I do believe that entheogens, when used in their psychedelics in these, can help us see these other perspectives and then right. can move okay, us forward. I and I, be- okay. and I believe this generation's hungry. So yes, on one hand, we have people leaving churches and droves and we we have the breakdown. On the other hand, I think we're having a demand. Why are we seeing these psychedelic churches popping up? Because people are demanding, okay, I want a direct spiritual experience. And I didn't know I could have one. I just thought church was weaponized against me. I, I just thought church was boring. I just thought church was books and words and rules. I didn't know I could have my own relationship with my sacred. And now that God I know that, I want God has been disintermediated, right? I mean, that's, and I think that's why back in the 60s, the church was against it because otherwise you're, you don't want to go through um, your, your clergy, uh, you know, whoever, whoever that power in, in the synagogue or, or temple or wherever it may be. But yeah, so, you yep. know, now the, the, the religious experience gets disintermediated, which it should. And, and it's so short-sighted of the churches that aren't embracing this. And that, because once you have the awareness, the awakening, what do you want? You want the community, you want the relationship, you want the practices. And to get those things, this infrastructure exists. It exists for lots of big reli- r- wisdom traditions and smaller wisdom traditions. And and again, embracing this as a tool for their congregation to dive deeper seems to is what I'm hoping for in this next generation. Uh, can we go way back in this conversation? We talked about grief. Let's go way back, way well, back. Uh, you, you, just, you triggered this with the, with the discussion of the elderly. And again, I'm going to keep going to Johns Hopkins, but Yale, UCSF, um, they're doing beautiful work using psilocybin, magic mushrooms, with end-of-life diagnoses. So we know that you have an end-of-life, di- you have a terminal diagnosis. You don't have time to mess around with, will this antidepressant work? Will this antidepressant work? And we know that, of course, they're feeling depression. They're feeling anxiety. They're feeling this exos- uh, this existential morose. And they're finding that psilocybin can very, very quickly drop all that down. So that's that's the med- one use of the medical model for that particular community. What I'm seeing in the ceremonial space is now... Okay, not just giving it to the person who's in the active state of dying, but giving it to the friends and family who are bearing witness. And now this tool helps everybody understand, oh, we're spiritual uh, beings having a human experience. Oh, I need to say this before this person leaves. I want to have this healing. I want to have this forgiveness. I want to share this love. I want to ask these questions. It's incredible. Um, well, in that default mode, no, like, right, because so often you're afraid to say the things you want to say, and then you regret not doing it. And it just, it strikes me with your default mode network, that inner critic that, you know, is worse in some of us than others. But I think it's existent in everybody that that just said that kind of how that, that critic gets replaced with a desire, which feels so natural to, to really feel connected. And really feel that that loving bond. I mean that that's like a miracle. 
And for a lot of families, it's a miracle and it leads to conversations that needed to happen. It leads to intergenerational healing. It's, I, it's I mean, an I'm, interesting yeah. thing because people who are in those last few days or hours already have what they do describe as the hallucinogenic experience where they're seeing things. People say it's spirits. Is it the brain? Is it that the brain's already trying to provide something that is um, interworldly or I'm not having the right word, but you know, like my own, my grandmother kept seeing her loved ones and this dog that she loved. And it was like a very, she kept talking about feelings that she'd never understood. It's almost like that makes the most sense right there because they're already, their brains are already doing that in a way. And then to be able to bring the family members into that experience sounds lovely. Let me ask one last question before we wrap up, thinking back to family and where, where relationships can get hard. And you referenced how hard uh, your parents getting divorced when you were so young, how hard that was for you. I've heard that MDMA can transform marriage. Is that accurate? Oh, I, as, a, as a couple's tool, it is so beautiful. And when you turn, so again, when, when that medicine turns off shame, blame, and guilt, and it opens up love for self first and then love for others, it allows us to have conversations where I can look at you and say, Andrea, I love you so much. And when you do this, I feel that. And then I can hear that, or you can hear that and say, oh my goodness, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. And I just didn't understand without that defensive reaction. And then those conversations, unlike, I don't mean to say unlike talk therapy, but unlike talk therapy, it's visceral, it's somatic. It's it's a knowing beyond the surface level and it's an understanding. And with these medicines, you remember this after. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's incredibly powerful for, for couples. It's incredibly powerful for parents and children. I love... 75-year-old mom with 50-year-old dad and 25-year-old son in the same ceremony is incredible. Um, and yeah. I love it when it's couples in the same ther ceremony. And, and that can be incredible. Well, I'm well, so... We're talking... Oh, hang on, uh, Joanne, just because we need to wrap up. I just, I mean, Matt, I'd love to have you back on because there's so much more to talk about. But the one when you and I had spoken earlier, um, the uh, Heroic Hearts program, you referenced... The, you know, 30 something thousand uh, veterans have died by suicide. It is just it's so heartbreaking. Will you just talk for a minute about what you're personally doing in the organization you're working with to help veterans? Because that's a very, very at risk group that have served our country and that deserve to be helped. And I just I'm so grateful you're doing that work. So what is Heroic um, Hearts Program and how can people contribute or learn about it? Yeah, thank you for that. Heroic Hearts Project is a nonprofit that is really dedicated to helping veterans with treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder move through this. And they have historically done this by raising as much money as they can and sending these veterans down to Central and South America to experience ayahuasca with therapy provided before they go down and after they return. So it's a comprehensive program. They've now done two cohorts up in Oregon using psilocybin mushrooms. Yay, Oregon. I would imagine that Colorado will come online. At Denver. <laughs> and when, when that happens, which is incredible. But th this organization, they just care. They care about the veterans. They care about the military spouses. And they're just trying f to find ways to heal. For those who are listening who don't know, with MDMA, which is the, the, the medicalization of this, um, they've given veterans with treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder three sessions with MDMA, the therapy before and after, and upwards of 70% emerge without a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. It's incredible, powerful medicine, and it's going to be very expensive. So I don't see what... The, I see the work that Heroic Hearts is doing just continuing forward. I created um, with them a, a book called The Veteran's Guide to Psychedelics. It'll be out August 1st. And this book is really designed to help the veteran prepare take their notes during their 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 treatment or their ceremony and then integrate back into a post ceremony and then there's a whole book that works with the coaches and the therapists that they can work with the veterans efficiently who are you choosing through this program but I love the work that heroic hearts project does amazing oh my gosh Matt you are amazing thank you for your work thank you for your big heart and openness uh, come back and um, I look forward to continuing to learn from you thank you so much Andrew, Joanna, Brian, thank you so much for having me on.
Wow. So inspiring. I mean, it really does feel like we are at the precipice of a of a renaissance in in mental health and wellness and, and love and connection. And Joanne, I heard you loud and clear with some of those questions and his response, like, yeah, some people are going to abuse it. I mean, that's just that that's human nature. And when I think about how many people whose lives have been transformed and how many more stand to have their lives transformed. I think of, you know, in the extremes, you know, the veterans that he talked about with PTSD and suicidal ideation and all those people that are that are really, really hurting. And then I think about Michael Pollan in in, in his book when he just talks about as a, a famous food writer, how I, I don't I don't want to speak for him. I don't know if he was depressed or anxious or anything like that. But when he describes his use of psychedelics and it transforming to make his life so much more beautiful. And even Matt, where it was like, yeah, I, my life was fine. You know, he wasn't desperate, but now his life is beautiful. It just gives me a lot of hope for the rest of us that um, so many more people can access um, this uh, medicine to, to thrive. All right, uh, let's wrap up. Thanks for listening and or watching the show. Uh, you are welcome. In fact, we'd, we would love to hear from you. If you want to email us uh, ideas for guests, feedback, advice on the show, our email address is openrelationships at your tango.com. We would be super grateful if you followed us on social media. Uh, subscribe wherever you listen or watch the show, iHeart, Spotify, YouTube. We are bringing you the show with our full hearts uh, because we just know there's such an opportunity sincerely to transform together by asking sincere questions, having the tough conversations, and and recognizing uh, the opportunity to make our world and lives better together. All right. Thank you. Thank you.